I want to thank you uh, this morning for allowing me the, uh, this opportunity to be with you. Um, when my children were growing up, I always had to tell them that I can't be in two places at once, but today I am. Today I'm with you in this method, and I'm actually with them uh, attending the Riverside Congregation in Council Bluffs, Iowa. I'm sorry, you're not getting his voice? Might have been me. Uh, for services, and we will join them then for lunch afterwards. So, um, looks like uh, things are going to be good for a while as far as uh, safety goes. So, we'll see how that works out in the long run. But I want to begin this morning um, by reviewing the days leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus had been traveling about the countryside with his disciples, preaching and teaching and doing miracles for quite a while. Um, as it came time to head to Jerusalem, he begins to forewarn the disciples of his upcoming death. Now he did this for three times at different periods while he was preaching. Three times he does this, and they still don't get it. Now it's time for the Passover, and they meet in the upper room of a house that had been prepared for them. During their supper time, he begins to talk about what will happen next. Let me read to you from Paul's writing our first scripture for today. Coming from the Message Bible, 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, 23 through 26 verses. This is Paul. Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it's so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. The Master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread Having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize, Paul said, is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. It's only fitting that we have communion today on Easter because without the Last Supper, there would be no Easter. I want to share with you a confessional reading that I found. Uh, it's written by Peggy Michael. It's adopted or adapted um, from her. Had I not looked into the pain-filled eyes of my suffering Lord, perhaps I, too, would have shouted, Crucify him! But I did look, and I saw, and I felt. As the lashes cut into his innocent flesh, I cringed and wanted to wash his wounds with my salty tears. When his kind voice whispered through swollen lips, Father, forgive them. I will bear their sin. I cried out, Savior, will you also forgive me? 
as I peered into the shadows of my mind, I saw the cross where they nailed his pure form. How could they do this savage thing? And then a kind voice answered me, do not your sins also cause my suffering? In contrition, I responded, yes, my Lord, my own rebellion deepened the nail prints. I too left you to suffer alone. And I repent that my tears bathed his righteous feet. Do we not all deepen his wounds with our separation, but still we return to his side to receive his grace? It's time to forget our apathy as he does and continue his work for reconciliation and peace in the world. On Easter morning, people come expecting to hear post-resurrection stories of Christ. Some will look forward to remembering how Jesus had breakfast with disciples by the sea or overhearing a conversation with the risen Christ in the garden outside the open tomb. Our second scripture for today, however, doesn't refer to any meals on the beach or a peaceful garden scenes with Jesus. This passage from Mark includes no post-resurrection appearances, and it's likely that the original text of Mark didn't include any such sightings. So again, from the Message Bible, the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they could embalm him. Very early on Sunday morning, as the sun rose, they went to the tomb. They worried out loud to each other, who will roll the stone back from the tomb for us? And then they looked up and they saw that it had been rolled back. It was a huge stone and they walked right in. They saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed all in white. They were completely taken aback and astonished. He said, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, the one they nailed on the cross. He's been raised up. He's here no longer. You can see for yourselves that the place is empty. And now, on your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there exactly as he said. They got out as fast as they could, beside themselves, their heads swimming. Stunned, they said nothing to anyone. The text begins with a funeral, or at least the final preparations of a corpse. People came expecting to find the body of Jesus decaying in the tomb. The vision, the mission, and the movement to change the world to which these women and others were beginning to lay claim had come to a screeching and tragic halt three days earlier. Now, all that was left to do was prepare the body, mourn, and go back to life as it was before they met Jesus. But they found the tomb empty and heard an incomprehensible message about Jesus being in Galilee. Leaving the tomb in terror, the women told no one of their experiences, possibly because they couldn't reconcile their experiences with the expectations they brought to the tomb. Our expectations too can become the lenses and filters for what we see and hear. Disciples and congregations must ask, with what expectations are we viewing and hearing from the world?
A young man at the tomb told the women, Jesus wasn't there. Well, how could this be? This is where they last saw Jesus. He must be there because it was where they left him. The message of the Easter story is one of surprise, which means not only not always finding Jesus where we last saw him. In our lives, we sometimes wander around old places, still expecting Jesus to be there waiting for us. Sometimes those old places, even though they may be painful, can become more comfortable than the new places where the resurrected Christ may now be. The women fled. Terror had seized them. Before his death, they witnessed how Jesus' radical ways had angered religious and community leaders. Now he had overcome death, and they were told to meet him in Galilee. Well, how much more radical might a resurrected Jesus be? Is it possible the terror they were feeling was from the uneasiness of considering what he might now be doing in Galilee and what they themselves might be called to do. The story continues. And as disciples who believe in resurrected Christ, we are called to live out the next chapter of that story. That next chapter is about us meeting him in the Galilees of our communities. Easter is about surprise. Do we see the world through the lens of resurrection or through the lens of an unexplained empty tomb? Our expectations influence what we see and hear. What are the empty tombs in our lives on which we continue to linger and cling? Why is it that sometimes more comfortable to linger around the empty tomb than to go find Jesus in Galilee. The resurrected Christ is in our communities, waiting for us to meet him there. Now let's skip over to our third scripture for today, the 20th chapter of John, verses 1 through 18. Now, the Gospel of John presents Jesus as the risen Lord, the Messiah, and the Son of God, one in whom we should have faith. The resurrection account is the climax of that faith statement, and for John, the final proof of Jesus' identity. So here in, in the book of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the tomb was that the stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, breathlessly panting. They took the master from the tomb. We don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple left immediately for the tomb. They ran neck and neck. The other disciple got to the tomb first, outrunning Peter. Stooping to look in, he saw the pieces of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived after him, entered the tomb, observed the linen cloths lying there, and the kerchief used to cover his head not lying with the linen cloths, but separate, neatly folded by itself. Then the other disciple, the one who had gotten there first, went into the tomb, took one look at the evidence, and believed. No one yet knew from the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The disciples then went back home. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she knelt to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels sitting there, dressed in white, one at the head, the other at the foot of where Jesus' body had been laid. They said to her, Woman, 
Why do you weep? They took my master, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. After she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus, Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, Mr. If you took him, tell me where you put him so I can care for him. And Jesus said, Mary, turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, meaning teacher. Jesus said, don't cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go to my brothers and tell them I ascend to my father and to your father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went, telling the news to the disciples, I saw the master. And she told them everything he said to her. The scriptures tell of two separate traditions of witness to the resurrection. One was the tomb, emptied of death. One was the report of the living Christ. Some saw only the empty tomb. Some never witnessed the tomb, but experienced the risen Christ. The Gospel of John tells us Mary Magdalene saw both. It was not the empty tomb that won her faith, but the sound of her teacher's voice. In John's account of Easter morning, different people came to faith in Christ along different paths. First, there was the beloved disciple who looked into the empty tomb and believed instantly. What did he understand when he saw the empty tomb? What did he believe? John gives us no answer, but merely says, faith was the result. Then there was Peter who saw the empty tomb and the empty shroud where the body had been. But unlike the beloved disciple, Peter returned home without faith or understanding. Mary Magdalene was the third one who saw the empty tomb, but understood only the body was gone. Stolen, well, maybe. Moved to another location, perhaps. The empty tomb didn't prompt her to believe in the resurrection. She saw two messengers of God within the tomb, but that didn't lead to faith. She encountered the risen Christ, but mistook him for the gardener. Her eyes were opened only when he spoke her name, recalling a familiar relationship of love and caring. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. We read, that, read those words in John chapter 10. The living word and the one word, her name, brought Mary to faith and rejoicing. From that point, relationship is the key theme of the story. With a surprising economy of words in verses 17 and 18, John outlines a swift reordering of relationships. Jesus tells Mary not to hold on to him. The word touch in Greek implies being attached to, in essence, holding on to. Now it could mean, don't hug me, don't be too attached to me, and don't become dependent on me or don't expect this relationship to be a continuation of the old. Resurrection had transformed the old relationship into something new. I am ascending to my God and your God. 
the relationship with God must take priority in death and resurrection as it did in life. But in addition, Jesus was saying to his followers that saying his followers could enjoy the same relationship with God that he enjoyed. The disciples, as Jesus' siblings, could claim God as Father in a new, complete relationship. Jesus directs Mary to go and tell the disciples. Despite betrayal, denial, fleeing in fear, and lack of support, the disciples were still Jesus' disciples. He claimed them. His relationship with them was closer than ever. Mary's relationship to time changed. She had focused on the past and what was lost. Jesus pointed her toward the future and what could be. As she hurried to tell the disciples what she had seen, she became the apostle to the apostles. Those who witnessed resurrection appearances did not keep silent. They were transformed. From their testimony and witness came a movement that grew and changed the world. Followers continued to encounter the risen Christ in various ways through the centuries. Sharing that testimony still makes a difference in the world, bringing new life. Resurrection, therefore, is not a one-time event that came and went. It is a daily event as people receive God's grace, God's love, and a new life through Jesus Christ. Embrace new life. The Easter story reflected in John's gospel is a story filled with mystery, suspense, tension, doubt, emotional confusion, and fear. But the power of the story is the extraordinary surprise and joy in seeing Jesus alive. Easter is an important time for the faith community to gather to remember that extraordinary experience. Yet, it is more than just remembering the empty tomb. As the receivers of this proclamation and witness, we now hold the responsibility for the continuing proclamation of, we have seen the Lord. The tomb is empty and Christ is alive and present in the world. And as disciples, we need to be intentional in seeing where, where Christ is working among us so we can say with great joy, we have seen the Lord. Come and let me show you. Amen.